AP Calculus BC, uh, Unit 8, Day 7. This is just sort of a little extra, <clears throat> little extra background on uh, some of the things that we've been talking about in class, just to give you a little more, I don't know, maybe a little more uh, faith or comfortability, you know, being comfortable with it. So, um, I mean, I know myself, I... I have a hard time just taking things uh, for what they are. So here's some formulas and the proofs for them uh, for some of these formulas that we're using right now. So uh, consider functions f with derivatives of all orders. So this is the Taylor series, right? We've been talking about this, the derivatives times x minus the center to the nth power over n factorial, infinite series, the nth partial sum, uh, of this Taylor series is the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So if you cut it off, uh, you get, you know, it's a finite series. And then we can say that, well, the actual function equals the Taylor polynomial plus the rest of the terms, which we call the remainder of the Taylor series. Okay. So this is all about the formula for the remainder of the Taylor series. We know that F is equal to the sum of its Taylor series on the interval X minus A as long as it's less uh, on the interval where this is less than r, if we can show that the limit of this goes to zero. So if we if if we take into infinity to take the infinite terms, then the remainder, what's left between this and the actual function should go to zero if this is true. So this is the uh, this is the expression uh, for the remainder. Uh, if f n plus 1 is continuous, the, the next derivative is continuous, exists on open interval i that contains a, and x is in i, then this is the remainder of all the other terms. So we're going to use mathematical induction. So mathematical induction is a little means of proving a theorem by showing that if it is true for any particular case, like it is true for the next case in the series and then showing that it is indeed true for that case. So we're saying when you improve it a special case, then accept that it works for the next one and prove that it works. And then therefore it must work for all cases. So this is a, you know, a type of direct proof. So I'm not going to write all this down, but I'm going to try and walk through it. And I've already written some notes on it, but we can uh, kind of, try and follow along together. One of the cool things I like about this is it uses so many of the things that we've learned in, in Calc AB and Calc BC. Um, so let's see if we can prove, you know, so if that's true up here, if F, if the function equals the Taylor polynomial plus the remainder, then the remainder equals the function minus the Taylor polynomial. So we're going to go ahead and use this just for an order one Taylor polynomial. We're going to say n equals one. I'm going to make it really simple. And um, okay, so we're going to start with a you know special case, just order one Taylor polynomial. So that's at subscript one represents. Now, uh, so we have the function. Now we know that that Taylor polynomial, the way we construct it is we take all the derivatives at the center. And so this is a first order. So you need the zeroth derivative, the original function. And then you need the first derivative evaluated at the center and then X minus the center to the first power over one factorial. So, I mean, that's how we build a Taylor first order polynomial. That should be familiar. And now we subtract it from this. So we got to distribute the subtraction. And so we get, we get this. Okay. And the integral. Uh, so now we're going to, we're going to stop there for a second. Now we're going to take the integral uh, from the theorem and just the integral part, not with, without the factorial. And we say, well, if we're going to integrate this, how do we integrate? Well, we got to use integration by parts. So like I said, that's kind of cool. That's like one of those things from this year. So integration by parts, we're going to set u equal to x minus t and dv equal to the second derivative. You usually kind of want to set the derivative to the derivative part so you can undo it. So if we take the uh, derivative of x minus t, we get negative, x is just a number. We're taking derivative with respect to t, so x is a number. And then we take derivative of t minus t, it's a negative one dt. 
and we integrate dv to get v, which is just f prime. So if we rewrite this, this is that derivative up here. Now, by the way, this is this is the integral when n equals one. So we put n equals one in there. So that's the second derivative. That's why it's double prime, and that's why it is the first power. So when we do this, we get uh, uv, uv, which is right here, and we're integrating it from a to x minus the integral of the two new things uh, together, the dv and the and uh, the du. So that's going to be negative f double prime, the integral of, oh, wait, wait, sorry, the two new things right here, the integral of negative uh, f prime. Now, you subtract it. That's why it becomes plus, because you're subtracting, and it has a negative in it. Now, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you integrate f prime, you get f, and then you plug in the limits, right? That's a that's a nice theorem that we've relied a lot on. So if we put that in here, now if we go ahead and plug these limits in, we get x minus x is 0, so that first term goes away. And then you plug a in, you get x minus a, f prime of a, but it's negative. And then you have this plus fx minus fa. And so if we could just kind of rearrange it, we give it fx minus fa minus uh, f prime a, x minus a. And we're saying, okay, this is, this is the expression for the first order uh, remainder, okay? And then if we compare it to what we got up here, by just taking the function, subtracting the first order tail uh, polynomial, we get the same thing. So that proves it for that special case, n equals one. So then we say, okay, now let's use n equals k, like any value of n. So we rewrite the uh, remainder uh, formula up here, but we're gonna plug in n equals k. So it's gonna be one over k factorial, a to x, x minus t to the kth power, f to the k plus one derivative, k plus one derivative. And we want to show that it's true uh, for n equals k plus one. Okay. So we're going to say it's true for, for any value of k, and then we're going to try and prove that it's true for the next one. So here's the expression for when k, when you plug in n equals k plus one. So uh, we got to do integration by parts again. So we're trying to follow this. So I'm um, trying to do integration by parts for the n equals k plus 1 case. Um, and so I mean, this is what we're, this is what we're working on here. Um, so we're trying to integrate this one. Um, so we're going to set u equal to uh, x plus t to the k plus 1 and the dv equal to the k plus 2 derivative. Take the derivative of this, you get a k plus 1 in front, extra negative because of chain rule. And if you integrate this, you get the k plus 1 derivative, 1 before that, if you integrate. And so if I take this, um, I can rewrite now u times v, right? That's u times v, u um and and we're going to distribute this to everything to all the terms so there that there it is then it, it shows up here again but then it's just u this is u and this is v um and then we subtract the um you know, it gets it, it gets this one over k plus one factorial, but then we subtract these two new things right here. So it's going to be um, negative uh, k plus one x minus t to the k uh, f of k plus one derivative dt dt. So this is right. This is uh, integration by parts. The two negatives become positive. Um, we can move the k plus one out front because it's just a constant. And then this stuff stays inside. Okay. Now these things right here, we can we can simplify this because k plus one factorial is the same thing as k plus one times k factorial. So we just get one, we just get one over k factorial there. And it's positive now. 
Now over here we plug the limits in. We plug x equals uh, t equals x in. It goes, gives you a zero. Then you plug a in, and you get x minus a, and you get an a there. So we're just kind of working on this. Now this right here, this represents the remainder for the kth term. This is the formula for the remainder of the kth term. It pops out of this work as we're integrating. Um, otherwise, we'd have to keep using integration by parts, but we see, oh, hey, that's that's, that's the, the remainder for when n equals k. And so we go ahead and we write r sub k there uh, for the remainder. Um, and this right here, we clean that up and we write that. Now, um, if we... Um, now, we know that the remainder uh, for r sub k would be the original function minus the kth Taylor polynomial, okay? And so we, we uh, replace this with that expression for what the remainder represents, and we move this over here. And if we... Uh, now, if you look at this, you could say, hey, this is just, uh, this is just, this looks like it's just the next term um, in the Taylor polynomial, right? Right after k, this is the k plus 1 term. And so I factor the negatives out so you can see this. This is the Taylor polynomial. So here's the Taylor polynomial for n equals k, and then if you want the Taylor polynomial for uh, n equals k plus 1, you just add that next term to the k1, and, and that's what you get. And so therefore, function minus the k plus 1 factorial does give you the remainder, uh, the k plus 1 remainder. So it's kind of hard to follow all that, but then that proves that remainder theorem, okay, that that, that, that formula should be true. Okay, now on to another part. Um, so we know that, um, you know, so we're going to use an example. Here's a function of sine x. We're going to take its derivatives, like we're building the Taylor polynomial. And for this specific one, this will just kind of help us, you know, show how it works. Um, you know, uh, let's see. So here's the, the, uh, the remainder theorem that we just proved, okay, in general. And we're going to do it with the center at uh, a equals zero. So that's where that zero comes from. And go on to the next page. Now we know that all the derivatives are always going to be plus or minus sine or cosine for this specific one, right? If you look back at this list, it's just going to keep going back and forth between plus or minus, sine or cosine. And we know that all those values for sine or cosine, positive or negative, are always going to be between negative 1 and 1. Their absolute value is going to be less than 1 for sure, right? So we're going to use this to help us. Now, if we were to integrate a function, uh, you know, between, you know, that if we were to take the absolute value of an integral, it would for sure always be less than or equal to the absolute value of uh, the integral of the absolute value. Because what happens here is that the function itself might be positive sometimes, negative sometimes. You add them up, and then you take the absolute value. Well, if you take the absolute value of every single term first and then add them all up, integrate them, it's going to be not smaller than this. It's going to be bigger than it possibly equal if all the terms ended up being positive. So this is kind of an interesting idea that actually kind of comes back later too. So maybe some of the terms are positive and negative, and then we add them up, and then we take the absolute value. That's going to be smaller than or equal to if we had taken the absolute value inside first. Okay, so we're going to use that idea. Now for x positive in your limit right here, this is the remainder theorem. And we say, well, let's Let's, let's take the absolute value of the remainder, which we would often kind of see as like our error, right? Whether it's positive or negative or whether it's above or below the actual value, those other terms, that remainder, that's how far off we are. If we take the absolute value, then we could just say it, just treat it as just like error, just the magnitude of the error. 
which a lot of times is what we're more concerned with. Not if it's too high or too low, but how far off is it? So if we apply that idea to our, to our um, remainder when a equals zero, uh, we can move the one over n factorial outside because it's for sure positive, okay? And then based off of what we just said, we know that these derivatives, like we know that x minus the center, that's always going to be positive. So we, we can move the absolute values, can end up going right around the derivatives. Those are the things that are potentially positive or negative. And, and we already discussed for this specific one that we know that all those derivatives are less than one. So we could really just, you know, we're, we're kind of going, getting more and more vague. We say, okay, well, this is equal to this is for sure less than this. If we do the absolute values. And then if these are at most one, then this is less than if we just put a one in there. Right. I mean, worst case scenario, they're all one. Well, that would be this. And, um, if we were to go ahead and integrate this uh, x minus t to the n power, you would uh, raise it to the n plus one, divide by n plus one, and then you plug limits in zero to x. You need an extra negative because of the chain rule. And you plug in x and you get zero first, right? And then you plug in zero and you get x to the n plus one over n plus one. Now you got to subtract the second term, but it has a negative, so it becomes positive. And that's where this comes from, this x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial. If x was negative, we would do a similar thing, but we know that we would get a negative. Um, uh, if x is negative, then we know we're going to get a bunch of negative terms. So the remainder is going to be negative. Um, and so we go through the same process here and we get a very similar result, except that it's uh, negative x. Okay, but we know that, so we know that the remainder is less than this um, or it's, or it's going to be less than this. Um, so an absolute value, um, it's, it, that's what you're going to get. So the, now the right side of this inequality, this is just trying to prove that the remainder, this is a specific example trying to prove that uh, the remainder is sort of like your error. So um, as this is the remainder now for this specific sign series, this is what the remainder turns out to be. Uh, the right side of this equality as uh, n goes to infinity, um, this is going to go to zero, right? Um, and so this has to go to zero by the squeeze theorem because it's smaller than this. If this goes to zero and something's smaller than it, then that has to be forced to go to zero, okay? So that proves that since this is the remainder of this series, that as we take infinite terms, the remainder is gonna to go to zero and that means uh, our the McLaurin series does actually equal this, uh, the sine series, okay? Now for another, uh, part another formula that we talked about today. There's this this little theorem here that we want to just discuss real quick that we're going to use. Okay, this is not something we've seen in calculus, but it's called the weighted mean value theorem. Weighted mean value theorem. It says if f and g are both continuous and g doesn't change sign, so g is always positive or always negative, then there exists a number. C between the limits where you can you can move F of C out here. There, there has to be at least one value. So a lot of these mean value theorems are like, okay, here's the mean value and it has to happen at least once. Okay. So they're saying there has to be one, at least one value of C that uh, the integral of F G X would be the same as F times the integral of G. Now, this is where uh, they're going to try and prove this because we're going to use it in a second. So G doesn't change signs. So G is always positive or G is always negative. And we know that uh, X is between A and B for X is between A and B. This is only for A and B for the sake of def definiteness, definiteness. Uh, let's assume that G is always positive. So we'll go with that one. Extreme value theorem says that F has to have an absolute min and an absolute max 
on a closed interval, right? So that's a min, that's a max, which means the function has to always be greater than or equal to or less than or equal to its max or min, okay? So if, you know, if we uh, multiply this through by GX, we get MGX and FGX in the middle and capital MGX on the, on the top side. We're kind of setting up like a sandwich theorem here, a squeeze theorem. So if we now integrate the left, right, and middle, which we should be allowed to do, and you know that should still be true, okay? Then it says if the integral is zero, then the left side is zero and the right side is zero, and therefore the middle has to go to zero. So theorem two is true because both sides of the equation are zero. So that there has to be, you know, so uh, if it's not zero, then it must be positive. We already said for the special case that G is always positive. So we could divide this expression by the integral of GX. Okay. And then we would end up with this and the function has to be you know, the integral of f has to be some constant value between little m and big m, okay? By the intermediate value theorem, there has to be a value c, um, you know, for that goes through these, okay? So whew, f of c equals this. Uh, therefore, the, we sort of, we've tried to prove the mean the weighted mean value theorem. Okay, we're gonna use that though. Coming up next, we're almost done here. Getting really close to done here. But I mean, to me, this is sort of like uh, the, the, the hardest, one of the hardest formulas that we use a lot to make sense of. So this is the remainder theorem, which also represents the error, okay? So it says if Fn is continuous on open interval A, there exists a number C such that A and X such that this is the remainder, okay? So the remainder before was all, always involved this integral, but now they're saying, okay, well, there's some N plus one derivative valued at some point that the remainder has to equal, okay? The function G, X minus T to the nth power doesn't, doesn't change sign on the interval A to X. So the mean value, uh, mean, weighted mean value theorem for intervals gives number C between A and X such that this is true. Now, if we integrate this, so this is that remainder. This is, this is what we've been using for the remainder, All right? So here's the remainder theorem that I already proved. It doesn't have the factorial part right now, but we said, okay, somewhere, some value C we could, we could pull this out and these would be equal to each other. So we go and integrate this, which is power rule, n plus one divided by m plus one, extra negative pops out because the chain rule, right? Then we plug x in and it gives you zero, right? You plug x in and give zero. Then you plug a in and you get this. Here's some of the work right there, okay? Um, so therefore, this remainder theorem that we've been writing, and we just proved this part of it, equals this, fn plus one c, x minus a to the n plus one over n plus one. This is, the remainder is this. Now the hard part is we don't know what the value of c is to get the remainder perfect, okay? The formula for the remainder theorem four is called Lagrange's form of the remainder term, okay? This is, this is a different, this is a Lagrange's form and this is how he got it is very similar to the terms in Taylor series, right? It looks like the next term in the Taylor series, the Taylor, the, the n plus one after the last term we've kept. So that's kind of interesting and kind of makes it easier to remember. Except that f n plus one is evaluated at c instead of the center a, right? Because that's, that's the big difference right here is this right here. All we can say about the number C is that it lies somewhere between X and A, between the center and the value that we're evaluating the, uh, the series at. Now there's some more examples here. I'm not gonna get into that, but essentially what this is, this is the exact error, but we don't know what C is. Um, so 
what we do is we figure out the worst possible case, what would give you the biggest number. Because we know that there's one that's equal to it, and that would give you the perfect error. But if we find the worst value, the biggest value, then we know our error has to be less than that. And that's how we get the Lagrange error bound. So I'm going to stop there. But hopefully, if anyone was interested, that gave you a little more extra uh, background. And I might attach these pieces of paper, um, you know, or, or share them in this shared folder or attach them to this video. But um, I don't know. Maybe hopefully that satisfies some of you guys. It's 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 hard to follow for sure. Um,